Recording in progress. no está disponible por medio de Zoom. Gracias. Great, thank you. And so David, we'll go ahead and with uh, roll call. There we go. Uh, Commissioner Hunt. Present. Uh, Commissioner Ramon. Here. Uh, Commissioner Culbertson. Here. Commissioner Damhorst. Here. And Commissioner Johnson? Here. Okay, that, that's a quorum. David, we've got one more. Two? Oh, welcome, Commissioner Catherine Lee, new commissioner, coming to us from the Parks and Recreation Commission formerly. So yes. welcome to the Commission on the Environment. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks. All right, moving on to uh, addition or changes to the agenda. Do we have any additions or changes to the agenda? I don't think so. Okay, uh, moving on to approval of the minutes for the May 22nd, uh, 2024 meeting. If we can get a motion from that, anybody? I move the minutes. I need a second. second. Bob, okay, we'll take a vote on that. Aye. 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 Aye, okay. Uh, minutes pass. All right. So moving on to uh, public input and oral communication. Um, I did want to just let everyone know that the meeting's being made available through uh, the Zoom link and we will have it available for uh, uh, recorded in the future for sure. Um, I wanted to thank the additional staff that made that possible to the Community Development Infrastructure Department um, for making the broadcast and the recording possible. I know that, uh, um, that you guys were kind of called on at the last minute to do that. So we really appreciate uh, stepping up and, and helping out with that. So thank you so much for that. Um, and at this moment, I'd like to ask for any public input that uh, is not currently on our agenda tonight. Do we have any public input that might not be on the agenda? I don't know if we have any Zoom calls or anybody, no? Okay, thank you. Um, so before we get started, uh, I'd, I'd like to take a moment to provide just kind of a brief overview of how this meeting and future meetings will be organized for the Commission on the Environment. As some of you may or may not know, the Santa Cruz County uh, has developed an extensive climate action and adaptation plan, otherwise known as the CAP, and you're gonna hear a lot about that tonight. Um, this document's designed as a, as a strategic framework with actionable steps toward reducing the causes of global warming, uh, adapting our communities to climate hazards and ensuring the safety and well-being of those most vulnerable to climate change. Each one of these climate actionable steps has been assigned to the most relevant county department, best positioned to address the climate action item. Future Commission on the Environment meetings will feature a county department or departments and their respective report out on the CAP implementation objectives. So tonight we're going to hear from two of those county departments regarding their assigned climate action items. First will be Darcy Pruitt, research planner in the public works section of Community Development Infrastructure Department. And second will be Sierra Ryan, the water resources manager in the Health Services Agency, Water Resources Division. So now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Darcy Pruitt, who will be presenting on climate items 14, 15, 16, and 28 from the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. So uh, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Darcy. Thank you. Um, and actually, I'm going to hand it over to Steve, who's starting our presentation. Steve okay. Weisner. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good evening, um, Chair Damhorst and commissioners and members of the public. Uh, my name is Steve Wiesner. I'm one of the assistant directors in the Community Development Infrastructure Department. Um, specifically, I work in the Public Works Division, and I'm in charge of the county road system. And uh, this, this evening, I'll be presenting on strategy number 10, which is reads by 2040, increase the use of public transportation, walking or bicycling for commute trips by 15%. Um, so that's the strategy. Then associated with the strategy, there's uh, four objectives. There's an implementation objective, there's the code objective, there's a partnership objective and funding objective. So I'll cover all those. Um, and I'll start with some of our implementation objectives here. So um, on the screen you see here, we've got uh, four projects um, that are gonna speak to quite a bit of um, the work that we have to um, 
to satisfy this strategy. Um, and uh, the four projects are the Coastal Rail Trail Project, the Soquel Drive Buffered Bike Lane and Congestion Mitigation Project, the Green Valley Multi-Use Path Project, and the B-Cycle Bike Share Program. Next slide, please. Great. So we'll start with the, um, this is the Coastal Rail Trail, um, also known as the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. Um, our regional transportation commission, uh, you know, purchased the 32 mile rail line and, um, very quickly after that, I think they purchased in 20, 2012 and very quickly after that in 2014, um, we adopted the trail master plan, um, which laid out as sort of how the, all these segments of the 32 mile, um, branch line would look. Next slide, please. Great. So this is an overview um, from the northern end of our county all the way down to the southern end. Um, the northernmost being like Davenport and the southernmost being in the area of Watsonville. Um, and so this what this slide shows is uh, several of the segments that are actually underway um, and being worked on either uh, in the construction phase, um, which you can see segment five, which is the north coast phase. Um, that's actually under construction now. It's fantastic. They broke ground just recently. Um, that goes all the way from Wilder Ranch up to the Davenport area. Um, and then down the segments in the city of Santa Cruz, um, some of segment seven has been built. Um, uh, another part of segment seven, I think they're calling that segment seven B is in development. And then what the county is really involved in is the, is the following segments. So um, segments eight, nine, uh, segments 10 and 11, and then on through 12. Um, those are all being worked on. And you can see in the breakout um, in the slide, you can kind of see what the schedule is. Um, so segments eight, nine, um, they basically go from like the boardwalk uh, up to, I think, around 17th Avenue. Um, the city is leading that project in partnership with the county. And we're actively involved with it. Um, but they were taking the lead on it. Um, there's been some great wins on there. We've got quite a bit of money that we've um, run through grant programs. Um, and the project is still in, it's in development. It's in the final design and right away phase with the construction anticipated in 26, 28 segments, 10 and 11, which is a County led project. Um, we actually are just making our way through the right of way. Um, and we'll, or excuse me, uh, it, through the environmental phase. And, um, we are in just embarking on the final design and right of way. Um, and that's we, once we find, uh, all the f construction funding, there is quite a bit, uh, you know, um, that has been, um, that has been won through state grants, like somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 70 million, but it's an over a hundred million dollar project. So we're still continuing to seek funding for that. And then segment 12, which leads you down into the Aptos area of our county. Um, that's an RTC led project. They're doing that in conjunction with their highway one um, improvement project as well. Um, and so you can see they're, they're, they're approaching their final design on that and construction also is TBD um, pending funding. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to take you through these very quickly. These are renderings of what the coastal rail trail segments will look like um, once it's built. And so it's really cool. You can see kind of before and after um, down the bottom, um, this is segment 10 near 41st Avenue. And then on the upper left, there's segment nine near Twin Lakes. Next slide, please. And then we've got uh, segments 10, 11, and 12 depicted here. Um, and again, you kind of see a before picture and then an after with the rendering. So around Jade Street Park and Capitola area, you can see what that's going to look like. Um, and then on down through Aptos um, and then moving there, the very bottom picture is what a potential bridge might look like for pedestrian and bicycles. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to the next project. This is one that's actually under construction right now. This is a pretty transformational, very monumental project that the county has undertaken. Um, and we're in construction now. It's a five and a half mile project that's going to completely transform how it looks for both bikes and peds all the way from La Fonda to State Park Drive. Um, it's a 25, 26 million dollar project, a uh, very large project. Um, it's funded through the um, congested um, congested highways uh, through the SB1 program, through the state congested highways grant that we won in conjunction with the RTC. Um, and I'll talk about a few of the features here of this project that covers an incredible amount of, of SoCal Drive. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so what really we're doing here is we're trying to give more room back to um, bicycles and peds. Um, and we're doing that by taking a little bit of room away from cars, actually, and we think that will help with traffic calming. Um, and you can see those buffers. So the buffered thing, we think will make it more comfortable for people to actually get on their bikes and start using this facility. And we're doing a lot of sidewalk gap closures where they don't exist right now, um, particularly around the Cabrillo College area. And um, we're, we're putting in sidewalk where it doesn't exist right now. Next slide, please. 
Um, and more, so more about this, right? So you see that over a half a mile of sidewalk gap closures, we're reconstructing uh, almost 100 ADA ramps. Um, we're doing upgrades to 70 crosswalks. Um, we're adding all kinds of uh, mid-block crosswalk uh, rapid flashing beacons. These are pedestrian activated to increase safety um, for our pedestrians. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is just, uh, this really just kind of shows you what it's going to look like a little bit, what that buffer is really. It's a, it's providing a nice um, gap between uh, motorized vehicles and bicycles and also doing some vertical separation with, with the delineators and stanchions. Um, and so, you know, we're putting in two and a half miles of separated bikeway, uh, another 2.7 miles of buffered bikeway. Um, and we're doing actually another thing that uh, meets a lot of the cap goals is um, we're improving bus flow through this area, which is great. We're working in conjunction with Metro on this. Um, they've had big goals of improving their headway time um, and more reliability for their transit service. Um, and so we're putting in signal transit signal priority to 21 intersections. So we're completely revamping all of the signalized intersections along this corridor, Soquel Drive, which is one of our very busiest corridors in the county, um, for new modern detection equipment and um, bus transponders. And what this really means is that as buses approach these intersections, um, the phasing of the signals will allow them to get through. Um, and in times like today where it would just go red on them, it'll stay green for a little while and that'll really improve our transit reliability. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a stick figure of really what that project is impacting and all of the uh, signalized intersections that we're working on. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to another project that we're very excited about that actually just went into construction this summer as well. Um, this is reconstructing a multi-use path uh, along Green Valley Road. Um, it was an asphalt path that was probably built. You can see in the bottom picture there, you can barely see the path anymore. It's just about returned back to dirt. And uh, the county had built a lot of these separated pathways um, for pedestrian use back in the 70s. Um, but we found that the county um, hasn't maintained them and um, they've kind of like melted back into the soil, if you will. So we're, this concept here is to revive this path and bring it back to up to a more modern standard. Um, for both bikes and peds. Um, so it's, it's, it's the entire length of Green Valley Road between Airport Boulevard and Mesa Verde. Um, so it goes right through um, all the developed areas and urban areas along Green Valley Road. Next slide, please. Um, and so this just gives you a little bit of an idea of the cross section here of what we're still going to maintain bike lanes on Green Valley Road should folks you know, choose to use them, um, but we're putting in this 10 foot, average 10 foot wide multi-use path for both bikes and peds. So we're real excited about this because it, it goes by a county park, it goes by a city park, it goes by a messy school. Um, and it's also gonna provide links up to Holohan Road where we've got plans to put in something exactly like this. Um, so folks can, uh, can bike over to the other school complexes on 152. So that would be like the middle school over there, St. Francis High School and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so what this uh, slide just is telling you a little bit more details about this project um, and, the, and the goals, which I've kind of just expressed really, which is to make it um, more safe for all modes, um, but specifically bikes and heads, um, and to enhance connections to the school areas. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So now moving on to the next implementation um, objective, uh, which is the B-Cycle Bike Share Program. Um, so um, this is really, this is a multi-entity um, effort in that we realized that to do a really effective bike share program in our county, we really needed to get all the jurisdictions that have uh, urban, like dense urban populations together so that uh, when folks jump on these bikes, they can cross, you know, they can cross jurisdictions and, and has still use the same service. Um, and if you recall back to the jump bike days, the city was out ahead of all of us and you couldn't really take the jump bikes into the unincorporated areas. And so, so when we started first negotiating this with Beef Cycle, uh, who was the chosen uh, service provider, um, we did it in partnership with UCSE, Cabrillo, the city of Capitola, city of Santa Cruz, the city of Watsonville. So we really are bringing a comprehensive bike share program. Uh, to all of our residents in the county, in the dense urban areas. Um, and it kicked off uh, this year um, with expansion. So it started with UCSC in the city of Santa Cruz, and then it moved into Live Oak, actually just this past spring, and Capitola, the city of Capitola as well. Um, and we're working with B-Cycle to continue to expand service into the other areas of our county, like SoCal, Aptos, and then on down into Watsonville. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to address some of the other objectives that are that are in this strategy, um, 
One of them is to, you know, create partnerships um, and and funding opportunities for, for all of our partnerships. And so this is really just a list um, to show um, your commission all of the great work that our jurisdictions are doing together. And so um, I think I'll just read to them very quickly, um, just so you can get an idea, uh, you know, who the main players are and who, um, you know, the jurisdictions that are involved in this effort as well. So we've partnered with ecology action has been a great, great nonprofit to help us with some, some really great planning efforts on our roadways. Um, one is the complete streets to school plan, which is to figure out how to make it more safe, um, for, for both bike and peds, um, and for kids to get to and from their schools, mostly all around elementary schools in the unincorporated area. And then we completed recently, um, in the last year, the countywide active transportation plan, which was really a vision for the entire unincorporated area for both our bike and ped facilities. Um, so we have these as guides for staff and also to bolster our ability to win grants to implement these um, these projects within each of these plans. Um, we're continuing to provide through Measure D um, $20,000 a year for education, um, for bike education throughout throughout our county. Um, we, like I just said, we partnered with uh, multi-jurisdictional agencies across our region here um, to get the B-Cycle Bike Share Program. Um, online and um you know we're continuing to work on um like education programs like reducing litter and increasing biking so that directly through the green valley project we're doing that and um something we're really excited about that we're just embarking on is what we're calling a vision zero action plan and so what vision zero is is we became a vision zero county um, about a year ago and what that means is that really what we're trying to do is reduce serious um accidents, serious injuries and deaths on our roadways. Um, this is a problem in our nation um, and it certainly is a problem here in our county. Um, and so what this plan is going to do is really look at where we have problems and they're going to create heat maps and so forth based on collisions and and it's going to make suggestions on where we can actually make really good improvements to our road system to try to keep people more safe. And to do that, we're in partnership with Watsonville and Scotts Valley. We're creating this action plan, which there'll be a countywide task force that will involve law enforcement, all the other agencies where we can talk about all of these things. And, and, and it'll also allow us and enable us to seek more grant funding for implement, implementing these plans. Um, and then just on the right is a little bit of a brag, all the, uh, all the money that we've won recently. And, you know, all of this stuff speaks to this cap strategy, um, to, um, increase, you know, by 15%, um, you know, the use of these alternate modes. So next slide, please. And then I, I think this is last, although I can't say for sure. Um, this is, uh, this speaks to the code, um, the code objective, right? And so, um, this is actually to make things more safe. We realize that uh, e-bike use is growing rapidly in our county and we're having issues with mixing e-bikes with both regular speed bikes and pedestrians in particular. So the county recently adopted a new code, which is going to disallow the use of e-bikes on pedestrian facilities um, where there's a good bike facility next to it. Um, and so, so we've made some really good strides here and I would give uh, our first district supervisor um, Koenig credit for bringing this item to the board. It's certainly a, a goal of staff. Uh, so we supported it hundred percent. I think that might be the end of mine. Maybe next slide and let's see. It is. All right. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to open it up now for any questions from the commissioners. You know thank you. I'm, in, I'm particularly impressed with the level of granularity of your objectives. Uh, on this, on your partnerships, especially, and not just because I used to be with Ecology Action, but I just really appreciate what's in the cap and what's a relatively generic objective. Um, you've really fleshed it out in a way that I think is very impressive. And I just wanted to say that I think you're doing an, an, an amazing job of not only raising money, um, but of uh, implementing implementing this objective. How are you measuring the 15? percent for bicycling and the 15 percent for transit use. That's a great question. Um, the transit use obviously is going to come from Metro. They, they, they keep all of the statistics and numbers. Um, what we're trying to do is provide uh, improvements to the facilities so that this stuff can all happen, right? Um, as far as the numbers for PEDS and bikes, I know that we're working with the RTC. They, they're doing annual counts uh, throughout the county, throughout all the district, different jurisdictions. You know, and at some point, as these projects come on board and become you know useful for the public, we'll 
the goal is, is to see, you know, turnaround in these numbers. And so that's basically how we're measuring them is by, by counts, by bed counts and by counts. I think one of the things that's important for um, members of the public to understand is that often government is viewed as an entity that does a lot of feasibility studies and a lot of studies and a lot of plans, and we don't see the end result. The cap as put together and has it's been implemented into the body of the county strategic plan and operations plan assigned to departments to implement and so forth. That shows a level of, of not only we thought it through, we want, we're, we're putting budget numbers behind uh, the objectives, but the collaboration and cooperation articulated in the cap with the partners and the, it's really a very well thought out plan. And that's what positions you for money. And that's one of the reasons, as you said, Steve, that um, the county has been so successful in, in raising money. So I'm not gonna dominate here. I just wanna thank you, great job. Um, and just to remind um, everybody, because I can't remember either, um, staff comes back with um, OR3 to report back to the board once a year or twice a year on these objectives, I've sort of forgotten. I thought it was once. Um, do you know the answer to that, Darcy? I don't know the answer to that, but I thought it was once. Thank you, Tatiana. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Tatiana Brennan, uh, project manager for the CAP. So we will be coming back to the board in February. And in February, we will begin an annual cycle of reporting to the board on all 29 objectives and 167 strategies. And then in the mid-year, I think in fall, um, when the CAO reports on the operational plan, we will provide a summary of uh, CAP strategies that are in, contained in the operational plan. And during, at what point do you want to refine the metrics? Now you've established performance metrics and, um, and of course, performance metrics are, they're a little more art than science, right? <laughs> we, we endeavor, we don't know. So at what point do you come back to this body and then ultimately to the board to sort of fine tune those performance metrics? Sure, so we have a plan in the cap to update the strategies, the 167 strategies every two years. So the cap was approved in 2022. So we're now on that cycle to review those and make any adjustments. The objectives are every five years. So it would be five years from 2022, which is 2027. We'll be making those changes, coming to the commission and returning to the board. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Maria. I just had a follow-up question. Um, you had mentioned that you're working with collecting data, like number of bicycles and pedestrians used. Are you also going to be collecting data usage for your B-Cycle program? Uh, yeah, they're collecting very robust data because, of course, they can track all their stuff digitally. So, yes, we that that's being collected and it gets reported back to us every so now and again. We, we don't have enough data to really report anything, but it's definitely happening. Yeah. Is there a plan to sort of adjust like locations or increase the number of bicycles based on usage use or is it, is there any sort of plans about that? There is. Yeah. There's some flexibility within our agreement where they can add bikes online as, as they see usage go up and the need to be there. And certainly the dock, docking station locations and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a little tricky, you know, cause they are having issues with tampering and uh, vandalism and, you know, but some of the bikes are getting stolen. And so they're trying to fine tune their program to really work and really to become profitable. So it can be sustainable service. Yeah. Good question. Commissioner Hunt. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I was thinking about uh, your comment about uh, looking at safety for electric bicycles. And I think that's wise. It's certainly a first step. Um, we all see on the street that that's something that people are adjusting to. So I'm, I'm glad the county is getting ahead of that. As things have changed since the uh, branch rail line was purchased in 2012, especially with electric bikes. I'm wondering if the county is looking at electric bikes as a way of filling the gap uh, for transportation between South County, particularly Watsonville and Santa Cruz on the branch rail line. Um, is, that a, is that being looked at as a, a feasible way to um, get people um, from one end of the county to the other, uh, given that it might take a, a long time to get uh, rail uh, service on that line? 
Uh, that's a good question. I'm not I'm not aware of any effort where that type of uh, service would be provided. Like like the county buys a bunch of e-bikes and people can just use them or rent them. Um, you know, B-Cycle would be an option. And so that's great. We're bringing the bike share program on and they'll be down in Watsonville and they'll be able to travel across multiple jurisdictions. The facility itself, you know, we're, it's getting built and, you know, it, we're hoping that all of the different modes that um, are can legally operate you know, on the rail trail, we'll use it. And so that includes these e-bikes as well. And Steve, I just had one question about B-Cycle too. I don't know if there are any financial incentives or any kind of help for, for low income that might be able to, you know, open up that possibility, um, you know, for, for them, for any kind of our low income community at all. Yeah, I know that um, UCSC definitely, they're mostly being used right now on campus. I think that's where the big numbers are is between the city and campus. Um, and they do, I think UCSC is offering um, discounted B-cycle monthly passes and they're subsidizing them for their students. Um, I think there has been talk about that, doing that countywide for particular demographics and low income um, folks, but I'm not aware that that's been done yet, but it's something that's being talked about for sure. Yeah, okay. And then outreach too, I don't know if there's budget for you guys. I know everybody's pinched on budget. It, but uh, any any talk about outreach or getting this out to the public? I mean, meetings like this hopefully are helpful, but um, I didn't know if you guys had any other plans along those lines as well. Particularly for B-Cycle? Just in general, you know, as far as uh, trying to promote, you know, use of B-Cycle or, um, you know, Metro, anything along those lines, yeah. Yeah, um, I, there's multiple efforts happening along those lines. I mean, have happened. I mean, an example is we did a ribbon cutting in conjunction with the city of Capitola uh, when B Cycle came on board, um, and that was well advertised and well attended. Um, and I think the information is starting to get out there. B Cycle certainly interested in folks using their, you know, their their service. Um, and as much as possible, we try to talk about the the stuff that we're doing. You know, that that is going to benefit all these different modes of travel. Uh, I know Metro has actually been really active too. And if you look at their buses and their, the wave program they have going on. So I, if I'm hoping most of the, our community is starting to pay attention to this stuff, but yeah, the efforts will, they're happening and they'll be ongoing through press releases and through public, uh, you know, education. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from the commissioners at all? No, I'm going to open it up to the public then. If anybody had any questions or comments, can I, David, can I, yeah. Can I just make a suggestion or, or, or a comment? So CDI Public Works has three separate presentations, one on upcoming, you can see the first slide here, and then a, and then a third one on recycling. And okay, so let's go. We'll finish the presentations and then we'll go ahead. You might want to finish the presentations and, and have public comment after that or... Yeah, let's do that. Fine. If we do, If we do public comment after each one, it might... Put us over our time. Might okay. Last, this meeting might last a long time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A lot of members of the public here today. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay. So then, yeah, if, if uh, we don't have any more comments from the commissioners, we can move on to the next presentation. That would be great. I'm a member of the public who has a comment that's still open. Uh, we're going to do it at the end, if that's okay. Oh, thank you. Somebody not able to stay. For the full time? Um, how much live we're going to be here until for this presentation will basically wrap up in the next probably 15 or 20 minutes. Is everybody going to be okay with that? We'll probably be done with this presentation around six, three. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, well, why don't we manage time? We'll kind of see how it goes. And, um, and then we'll try to open up for public comment after that, if that's all right. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Damhorst and uh, the commissioners. My name is Carolyn Burke and I'm the Assistant CDI Director overseeing special services, which includes sanitation, uh, flood control and recycling and solid waste. Tonight I'll be presenting on our objectives related to stormwater and sanitation. So um, this is a slightly modified objective. The original objective for item 13 is to increase the use of recycled wastewater and stormwater for irrigation and general use. And for practical implementation, we modified that somewhat to be increased wastewater and stormwater reuse in the county. And the broadened um, objective uh, meets our implementation objectives, um, which are two projects, the stormwater recharge identification and mapping project and the Boulder Creek water quality and recovery project. Um, and our partners on these projects are County Environmental Health, the Office of Response Recovery and Resilience and the County Administrative Office. Next slide, please. 
So the stormwater recharge identification and mapping project aims to identify sites capable of providing significant water recharge to address regional water supply deficits, water quality and environmental protection. In addition to the CAP objective, both CDI and County Environmental Health have this in objective included in their operational plans. The stormwater recharge working group consisted of staff from both the public works flood control and environmental health watershed management divisions who developed a mapping tool based on evaluation criteria to identify sites that had the acreage to support meaningful groundwater recharge, as well as suitable level terrain to allow for recharge to occur. MARS scores were also considered. So MARS, M-A-R-S stands for managed aquifer recharge and the MARS quote, score considers both surface soil suitability as well as subsurface factors such as depth to groundwater. Additional identifiers were added to highlight disadvantaged communities, which can be an important factor for particular grant funding programs, as well as publicly owned parcel, parcels and parcels owned by larger organizations that may be willing to partner on projects in the future. Next slide, please. The resulting tool created by County GIS staff is a dashboard that staff can use to identify groundwater recharge opportunities throughout the county. As you can see, the project has identified a range of suitable parcels for groundwater recharge going forward. While review by staff did not identify any feasible public recharge projects in the near term, the tool can also be used by planning public works and environmental health staff during the review of redevelopment projects and associated mitigations to identify areas where it may be appropriate to impose recharge mitigations. With the tool now developed, the next step will include cross-training with planning staff and partner agencies on its use. Next slide, please. The second project considered in the CAP objective is the Boulder Creek Water Quality and Recovery Project. The project proposes to construct a community wastewater collection system to serve the town of Boulder Creek and adjacent residential areas along Big Basin Highway, also known as Highway 236 and Bear Creek Road in the upper San Lorenzo River watershed. To achieve this, it is proposed to upgrade and expand the existing treatment and disposal facilities serving the Boulder Creek Country Club area, operated as county service area number seven, and construct a new collection system serving the expanded service area. The wastewater system, uh, would replace several hundred aging septic systems and holding tank or hallway systems the area has historically relied upon for sanitary waste disposal. The expanded and enhanced treatment facility would also provide recycled water. Next slide, please. The project details involve a significant number of new residential and commercial connections for consolidated wastewater treatment. This slide shows the area that would be served by the project. Over 1,000 connections are proposed, 90% residential parcels and 10% community businesses. An initial feasibility study from 2022 estimates total project costs between 60 and $100 million, which supports permitting, right-of-way acquisition, and construction of eight miles of gravity sewer main, 12 miles of pressure sewer main, and associated sewer manholes, lift stations, pumps, and wastewater treatment facility with the capability to treat to tertiary quality standards to allow for beneficial use of the recycled water product. Next slide, please. The water quality and recovery project results in a constellation of benefits for stakeholders. As many of you know, the San Lorenzo River is listed by the federal and state government as impaired due to nitrate and pathogen levels. Steelhead population levels remain depleted. Coho salmon have yet to return to the watershed and the water supply for the city of Santa Cruz remains threatened by contaminants and under unreliable and dwindling supply. Both the San Lorenzo Wastewater Management Plan and the local agency management program identified the need to evaluate the feasibility of community sewer solutions for the Boulder Creek area. In addition to improving water quality in the historically impacted San Lorenzo River by reducing individual septic systems, the use of recycled water will reduce surface water use by entities like the Boulder Creek Golf Course. Introducing recycled water back into the system will have a secondary benefit of increasing flows in the San Lorenzo River, resulting in habitat improvement for aquatic species in the ecosystem as a whole. 
The project will increase climate resilience in the areas severely impacted by both winter storms and summer heat, providing a potential source of water for recharge projects. In addition to being a recycled water source, some of this water will be held in emergency tanks for fire suppression. Aside from the environmental and climate benefits, the project will provide critical help for both individuals and businesses still striving to recover from the impacts of the CZU fire. Many private homeowners in the service area are required to install costly alternative treatment septic systems to comply with current regulations. This project would allow property owners to not only establish affordable septic service and improve the livability of their parcels over time. Next slide, please. The initial phase of the project is being led by the County Office of Response Recovery and Resilience, who have received congressionally earmarked funds through the US EPA Community Grants Program to explore the feasibility of the Boulder Creek Water Quality and Recovery Project. The size and complexity of this project will require multiple funding sources and phasing. Community engagement and partnership will be essential at every stage of the process. The considerable project costs may be funded through a combination of grants and utilities service fees or bonds. Recognizing a large portion of the proposed service area contains properties which were affected by the 2020 CZU fire, the goal is to secure as much grant funding as possible to minimize burden on property owners. While these funds are not sufficient to address the full engineering design, permitting, or construction phases of this project, there's still an outstanding need for advanced studies and coordinated research or outreach within the community. The final EPA grant work plan will provide studies to establish feasibility and identify future partnerships. These include preparation of a base flow reduction study to quantify the impacts of sewer conversion on groundwater and river-based flows under a range of climate conditions, as well as expansion of existing water quality testing sites to support a higher resolution of baseline conditions in the San Lorenzo River. A demographic analysis will establish metrics on income and household demographics commonly used to determine local cost share for grant funding, and an economic study will be prepared to demonstrate demonstrate the potential positive impact on commercial viability in downtown Boulder Creek, serving to foster partnership and investment within the local business community. OR3 has already begun outreach to businesses and key agency stakeholders in Boulder Creek to identify future cost sharing opportunities where community interests is lined. The timeline for an ambitious project such as this is considerable with the overall process taking up to 14 years for full implementation. The tasks to come include identifying, applying for and securing funding, preliminary design and service area formation, preparation of environmental documents, right of way acquisition, preparation of plans and specifications, followed by physical construction. OR3 has conducted a study session with the Board of Supervisors in March of 2023 and provided an update in May of 2024 when they accepted the EPA grant funds. Additional updates to the board are planned moving forward, so stay tuned. That's my presentation, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna open it up to commissioners for any comments or questions. Commissioner Lee. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, can you just explain again what the base flow reduction study looks like? Um, so the base flow reduction study is looking at the base flows in um, the San Lorenzo River during the summer months are um, highly influenced by septic systems. Um, and their discharges. And so as people become more cognizant of their water use and they're using um, lower flow facilities, then that impacts the base flow in the San Lorenzo River. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I have a couple of comments. This is great. I, I was looking at some of the other objectives in the, the program and the idea of uh, looking at the county in terms of where the, the suitable recharge basins might be is something was I was going to mention on the other comments, but it's already been done in the Pajaro Valley uh, with UC Santa Cruz helping uh, implement a, a study around Monterey and Sa in Santa Cruz County. And we've also got contracts with farmers who have uh, agreed to follow some of their land that is suitable for 
for recharge and we're diverting water that would be going into cause flood problems with the Pongo River instead of going to the river, it's going to the diversion where it can be recharged into the aquifer. And if we have a countywide knowledge of that and uh, one of the other, I think it was, uh, we'll get to it in the one of the next presentations, I'm sure, but they say that they're going to look at county parks for suitable recharge sites. Well, if you have a recharge study for the entire county, then that already accomplishes that mission statement for counting parks because you'd already be inclusive. So that's great. The uh, city of Watsonville has been working with the Palm Valley Water Management Agency to uh, work with a recharge uh, reusable water out of the water treatment plant there, the sewage treatment plant. And we're using that water primarily for irrigation water. And I noticed that you're charging, talking about irrigation water for the golf course, which is great. But there may be other uh, private individuals like farmers that have grapes or, or um, tree forest plantations in the, in the general area of the mountains that could also use recharge water as irrigation water. So uh, I would just say expand the concept from just the golf course to other uh, agricultural interests. And the third thing is that when I was uh, just came back from Colorado yesterday, I was in the San Jose airport and all the little toilets said, recycle water is used to flush these toilets. So they had a big institution using lots of water and they're using recycled water. Now, obviously we don't have a big institution like the airport, but there may be other institutional uses for recycled water uh, besides uh, irrigation or besides um, recharge. So just keep, keep the door open for once you develop the facility and you've got the recycled water, other uses. Thank you. Great, great programs. Yeah. I'm going to keep it brief. Thank you. And on behalf of the 5th District Supervisor, thank you. We started looking at this 11 and a half years ago, and CDI has done a great job of collaborating, cooperating with our office, with Jimmy Panetta's office, to figure this out. Um, even though it's obviously a very technically challenging road, and it's going to be a lot of years to get it done. But it's also been a lot of years to coming. And the economic benefits, we often talk about the environmental benefits, which are huge and we need them. But the economic benefits to the, the residents along 236 who were CZU fire victims and the businesses in downtown Boulder Creek and the visitors who go to Big Basin are enormous, enormous, tens of millions of dollars of benefits. So it's really going to be a great thing for the community um, besides all the great environment. And just really wanted to thank you for your work. Thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? No? Okay. Um, I think we're going to move on to our next presentation then. So um, I think we have the slides queued up. And whenever you guys are ready. Thank you so much, Commissioner Damhorst. Uh, my name is Darcy Pruitt. I'm the uh, resource um, planner for recycling and solid waste. And I will be presenting on our CAP objectives. Um, we have four cap, to, cap objectives that um, I'm going to just provide an overview on all of them rather than going into deep dives so that we actually stay on time. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. So one of the cap objectives is to reduce the county landfill's carbon footprint. Um, and a lot of what's driving uh, these climate goals for the landfill is state legislation passed in 2016, commonly referred to as um, Senate Bill 1383, which was billed as the biggest change to waste management in 30 years. And of course, they're referring to that because what set up like modern waste management in California was the passage of AB 939, which basically set up the precursor to CalRecycle, which manages waste in all of the state of California. So a lot of new things have happened in waste management. And SB 1383, it's important to understand, it's not a waste bill. It's actually a climate bill. And it's focused on the reduction of um, short 
lived climate pollutants really focused on methane. And that's really what we're trying to do with our waste management policy at the landfill is to um, basically not put any organics into our landfill. And funnily enough, Santa Cruz County is way ahead of the state on that. We've actually been diverting um, all of our yard waste for more than 20 years. Um, and then we also run a waste energy, so landfill gas to energy reclamation. So we don't admit um, a lot of methane and we've done a lot to reduce that already. And this slide just provides you with some insight into what we know. Um, so in 2018, which was the last time the County of Santa Cruz did what we call a waste characterization report. So we actually looked at the waste that we would bury in the landfill. And we got in there and we took a whole bunch of samples to see what's actually in the waste that people are sending for disposal. So we're not looking at recycling. We're not looking at what goes in the green card the organics. We're just looking at what people say, that's trash, it needs to go to the landfill. We only had 1% of yard waste in 2018. So people are really good at source separating their yard waste. And in 2023, the last, the year that just passed that we have complete numbers for, we actually diverted since we started also diverting food waste, almost 50,000 tons of organic waste from landfill disposal. And all of that material, which includes yard waste, food waste, wood waste, and certain types of construction debris um, is diverted and converted into either mulch or compost or other soil amendments. Um, and then the thing that's a, a kind of a double bonus because we're not, because the thing that makes methane is the um, anaerobic decomposition of the organics in the landfill. So when we compost, we're doing that through a process that's aerobic. So it includes um, air, you know, so that doesn't make the methane, but then all the compost that we make when we spread it on land, um, it not only enriches the soil and helps um, improve um, soil moisture retention, but it's also a way to sequester carbon. So there's a lot of benefits to making compost out of our green waste. And wood waste. Yeah, you need to advance that slide. That's the slide. Sorry, you didn't get to see the slide. I'm advancing the slides on Zoom, and Bo is advancing the slides in the room. So we're trying to multitask. Okay, and we're going to go to the next slide. And this is um, the other way that the county's landfill reduces our carbon footprint. And again, we've had this in place for almost 20 years. Um, we have a landfill gas reclamation waste to energy plant. So not only are we trying to have less organics in the landfill to not make more methane going forward, but we have been reclaiming the methane that's produced from the historic burial of organics and other materials that convert into methane by collecting that. And you can see kind of in the lower right-hand corner, um, the methane collection part of the system. And those are all over our landfill. And we actually um, collect methane at our landfill and the neighboring Watsonville city landfill. And then we send that through a plant and we create enough um, electricity to annually support 3,000 uh, 3, households. And the county's committed to continue to doing that. Um, our contract is almost up with Amoresco and we're actively looking at um, ways to improve the quality of the product that we're producing. The next um, objective that I'm going to speak to um, is the reduce, reuse, recover, and repair goods to prevent waste. 
Now, the County of Santa Cruz has a lot of partners in this, but I think the partner we're going to focus on right here is the way that we partner with Gray Bears. Um, because not only do they run our recycling centers, but they also um, have a, a program where they accept uh, um, covered electronic waste. And that's sort of a twofold thing. Covered electronic waste, part of it is recycled as a diversion so the materials don't end up in the landfill. Um, but the other part of it is it attracts the sort of um, reusable electronics that they sell in their electronics thrift store. Um, but they also have, and this is another great thing that Gray Bears does, is they have a repair clinic. So they can take, they, they have a program where you can, on certain days, bring your electronics that aren't working. So that could be your coffee maker, your computer, or whatever it is that's electronic that fits into kind of the small appliance class. And they will help you repair it, or they will tell you uh, it can't be repaired and we will make sure it's disposed of properly. But they also accept materials that they then repair and sell. And that's something that doesn't happen a lot, but is a great way to make sure that reusables get reused. And then another one of our objectives is to increase demand for organic waste products. Now, the state, that law that I talked about, the short-term climate, SB 1383, um, that requires local jurisdictions, and that means all of us, the county and all of our local cities, to um, purchase uh, recycled organic waste products. So we either have to purchase um, waste that's made or products that are made from waste in California and use them in California. And the thing that you can do is you can either purchase the products yourself or you can arrange to have a direct service provider agreement. And we actually have a direct service provider agreement with our compost processor. And the amount of procurement that each jurisdiction has to do is required based on the population. And our population means that we have to buy, I think it's a hundred and 54,000 tons of waste products. But we actually do one better than that because our compost manufacturer, because they act as our service provider and they have customers who buy all of the compost that they can make, um, we have a lot of excess procurement capacity. So we're actually doing a little better than the normal procurement and we're not having to buy it. Um, ourselves, but it's actually going out into the world and is a desired organic product that farmers use to enhance the quality of the soil and all of those wonderful things that we've already talked about, about compost. And there's a bunch of numbers on the slide that you can read. But yeah, those 50,000 tons of yard food and construction waste have basically been sold and placed to cover our procurement requirements. The next objective that we have is to reduce food waste and to get excess edible food to people in need. Um, and this, again, we do a lot of partnerships um, and this is also part of SB 1383. Um, our waste franchise and our county is required to support edible food recovery capacity so that all of our, what they call edible food generators, which are grocery stores, hospitals, restaurants of a certain size, they have um, waste. And the way the state's analysis is, is if 100% of their organic waste is food waste, based on the analysis, 20% of that should be edible for human consumption. And while 
uh, Second Harvest Food Bank and Gray Bears and Valley Churches United and a lot of other like Barrios Unidos have been collecting edible food from edible food generators for a long time. SB 1383 kind of um, required a, a bureaucratic overlay. Let's just be really honest about how um, food recovery has to work and all the scorekeeping that jurisdictions have to do. Well, what we at the county and all of our local city partners decided was that we did not want to create more hoops for these wonderful people who are nonprofits. We didn't want to create more hoops for them to have to jump through. So what we ended up doing was partnering um, together to use some of the grant funding that we get from CalRecycle to implement this, to actually put out um, a request for proposal. And uh, we had three applicants and we selected Second Harvest Food Bank and they are actually doing all of the outreach to all of the food recovery organizations that are already their partner organizations. So we're basically trying to support the existing um, infrastructure for food recovery and make that um, happen in a way that is less bureaucratic and really supports the needs of the agencies with our grant fund with our grant funding. So instead of creating our bureaucracy, we're trying to support the existing organizations who are already doing the work. And that was a lot of um, kind of work to be able to make sure we had the right scope of work to support the right kinds of programs. And hopefully, because we just implemented this starting in on July 1st, so it hasn't even been a whole month yet, but already we've gotten all of our reporting requirements for CalRecycle because we, we got a lot of things in place up till now. We've done a survey of our all of our food recovery organizations to find out how much capacity they have, how much they have collected, how much more they could do with their existing resources. And the thing that's really exciting about the survey is we asked them to tell us what you need to do more. And they did, and we have grant funding earmarked so that they can take that money and hopefully like buy the refrigerators and the kinds of equipment that they need to, to kind of fill in the gaps. And that's really what the slide said. And that's the end of my presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm gonna open it up to uh, commissioners. Anyone questions at all? No? Great work. Commissioner Lee. One question. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, every one of you. I didn't say thank you, by the way. Um, just a quick question. Are places like stables and, and you know, barns and ranches and people who have um, livestock, are they given incentive to like deliver their manure for the compost project at all? So the way that um, the legislation works is um, it's separated. So the Air Board actually deals with the um, the manure part of the equation, and we deal with the solid waste part of the equation. So we're dealing with, and, and I'm not really sure why they decided that um, edible food fell into the waste category. I think it's because of the the research that, you know, a certain amount of the food that people throw away is truly edible. And to be honest, the, the, the bar for waste food to be edible is very high. I mean, it has to meet all of the health and safety food regulations. So it has to be within date. It has to, I mean, there's a lot of things that it has to meet to consider being edible, but also I got to tell you, last year we took our um, task force, our integrated waste management task force, so a commission like you, um, out to see all of our um, all of our waste facilities. And one of the places we visited was Gray Bears because of all the great work that they do. And they served us a recovered lunch. And a couple of the commissioners, who a couple of them are supervisors, were like. <gasps> We're eating recovered waste food. And then they realized like, oh, you're giving us food from Gales and salmon for lunch. And I mean, there's, yeah, it might be toward the end of the date, but it still has to be in date to be 
considered edible. And I got to tell you, it was a great lunch and a great experience. Yeah, question on. Oh, yeah, great. When I was reading through these uh, numbered objectives, I saw that they wanted to partner with the sheriff's office for recycled food. That's what they mentioned specifically. But you've just mentioned a whole bunch of different things that aren't mentioned as part of CCAP. And you're not getting credit for all the hard work you're doing in terms of getting all these organizations together and doing it. So I just applaud that because I was going to suggest that you expand the partnership, but you've already done it. You're just not taking credit for it. Yeah. Well, one of the things that that happened in the cap, and you know, no offense to the the process, but um, you know that there wasn't perfect alignment between all of the things that the departments do and that we're required to do, and the ideas that came out of the cap. So we're trying to kind of, you know, basically implement the things that fit into the cap but then also approach the CAP objectives. It's just we were, I'm talking about the things we've already done to implement CAP objectives, realizing that we were already on a trajectory that fit into some of these goals before we got some of the objectives. Yeah, this is just so exciting for me. It's all good stuff that I'm hearing you say that we're already doing and, and working on. I noticed that, you know, that one of the county objectives is to electrify vehicles whenever we can and, you know, reduce the carbon footprint. And again, under the landfill, they talked about doing electrification of, of internal kinds of things. But one of the things I saw on TV just the other day was, uh, and what we generally do in terms of collecting waste that comes in with, we put out contracts. They're not really county, as I understand it, they're not county drivers and county vehicles going around throughout the county collecting waste to tech, take to the to the landfill. And most of those are not electric vehicles, but they did have on TV the other day, they had these garbage or waste trucks. They were all electric. And the, the, so it might be a long-term goal, but it would be really fun because part of the biggest part of collecting waste and stuff is being done right now by, by diesel burning or carbon fuel burning vehicles. So in the future contracts, we might want to uh, see if it's possible to get contracts with electric trucks. That yeah, are well, and, and I can speak to that a little bit. And one okay. of the reasons I didn't speak about it is because we don't have anything done on the ground. So our franchise agreement covers vehicles and negotiations about how things will be collected in the future. And we don't have that contract coming up until 2028. So it's a little off in the future. And in some respects, it's a good thing because we're actually watching our neighboring jurisdictions, both the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville. They have, I think the city of Santa Cruz has an electric collection truck and it is not working out that well for them. Um, Watsonville has a second generation that I think is still on order. I think it's been 18 months that they've been waiting for it. So mm -hmm. they're not coming off the production line at the rate at which you would think. The thing that we have in our own budget, because even though we don't, we have our franchise hauler does the collections, we do transfers between our facilities to um, Marina, where we transfer all of the material that comes into Ben Lomond. So we used to bury some of that at the Buena Vista landfill, but now we're transferring it all down to uh, the Marina landfill. Um, so we actually have $500,000 set aside in our budget for this fiscal year to buy an electric transfer truck. But the electric transfer trucks just really aren't where they need to be to be able to do the haul through the mountains to get it all the way to Marina. And we don't actually have the infrastructure, the fast chargers that are needed to charge the batteries for the big trucks yet. So there's some kind of phasing that's involved in making that work. Again, why it, why it wasn't in my presentation, but it's certainly the things we're trying to watch. And we're also trying to spend smart money. So we don't want to buy the technology until we're sure the technology can service our community. And our community is a place that is very hilly. And that is something that we notice is very difficult for even our smaller vehicles. And the place where we are trying to focus, again, smart money, is we have a lot of um, just unleaded gas vehicles that we use on our sites, you know, pickup trucks to get staff and equipment around the sites that we, 
you know, both at Ben Lomond and at Buena Vista. And those are probably the low hanging fruit, the place that we will electrify first. But again, we have to have the infrastructure to be able to do the charging. Yeah. So a lot of our goals and mission things here are over time periods. And, and I agree, you know, we can't put it in place if they're not providing us with uh, proper equipment. So, but it could still be a long-term goal. It's put in it with some kind of a, a distant someday, maybe we'll have wonderful garbage trucks that are all electric. Yay. So uh, anyway, just uh, I, so many things that you're doing, I, I don't see reflected in even the planning process, but we should be taking credit of them and uh, happy to see all the things you're doing. Thank you. Mr. Hunt, no. Any other questions? No. Um, I just wanted to say um, I can't overstate how important the work that you're doing is um, in terms of SB 1383, in terms of um, methane reduction. As some of you know, and I, I'm speaking now to the general public too, um, SB 1383 is a required law now that we're supposed to process all of our organic waste, either through our green waste bins or through a city program that's set up. Um, that can have the most impact impact in terms of, you know, global uh, warming and, and uh, the removal of basically greenhouse gases. So I, I really want to take this moment to emphasize how important it is to manage our organic waste and the work that you guys are doing and those topics that you talked about are one of the, some of the lowest hanging fruit that we really have control over and, um, and, and, and basically can really make a huge impact from that. So um, I wanted to thank you for, for taking that on because that's, that's something that's kind of a little bit near and dear to my heart, as you can kind of tell. Um, so, so thank you for that. I did have a question about the Buena Vista landfill and that are you guys still on schedule for, I think it's winter 2025, because that's going to be kind of a new composting facility that's going to hopefully reduce the number of trips to Monterey in terms of that landfill. Um, and I just didn't know if you could speak to that a little bit in terms of like an update, because there are going to be waste to energy technologies that are going to be used there at the same time. And then also if you had, because I've been down to the Monterey uh, facility down there and it's unbelievable the generators that they have. They have so much energy that they're actually going to pipe it over to the water um, treatment facility. So it was just unbelievable to see this room of, you know, basically engines that were running off of, you know, methane gas that was a byproduct that they they would normally have to flare off or, you know, send it. I mean, they burn it so it becomes CO2 and it's not methane. But um, I didn't know if you could talk at all a little bit about the Buena list of an, landfill and, and, and how it was going to end of life um, ultimately because it's starting to get full. So um, I can speak a little bit to that, but I want to be conscious of time just because we're a little over our time and Sierra has a presentation to do yet. Um, okay. But we can do that offline if you want to, or if you can just, yeah, just I a couple. I can give you the quick synopsis. That'd be great. Um, we did the, um, the initial outreach meeting. So we did the kickoff meeting for the environmental impact report under the California Environmental Quality Act for the Buena Vista redevelopment project. Um, that was in February. Um, we are finishing up the project description and all of the environmental consultants are now off and running with all of the um, information that the county has provided to them. I think we are expecting um, to have, I don't think we'll be at, at uh, admin draft stage of the EIR until probably fall at the earliest. Um, but yes, it, there's a public process and it's moving ahead. And that's where we will analyze all of the different alternatives for um, both either an on-site compost facility or an off-site compost facility, but all of the different things. And there is a website. So if you go to the county and you, or if you just go to Google and you uh, search Buena Vista Landfill Redevelopment Project, there's a really fancy thing on our website. So you can look at all the project documents and keep up with what's going on there. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. If there's anything the commission can do to help you out with, you know, some of your objectives, please let us know. Cause that's, uh, that's, I think is it's a huge impact, huge impact. So, um, okay. No more questions, right. From any commissioners. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on then Sierra. Thank you. 
Hi, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Sierra Ryan. I'm the Water Resources Program Manager for the county. I'm housed in Environmental Health, which is part of the Health Services Agency. Um, we had fewer objectives than CDI did. Um, today, I'm going to be here to talk about one of them specifically, which was to protect or better protect and manage county aquifers. Uh, there are four strategies listed in the 2022 cap under that. Um, two of those are actually more related to what uh, Carolyn was speaking to earlier, the recharge. Instead, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we've realigned some of the, the CAP objectives, again, to be more in line with what we're working on um, and talk about groundwater sustainability. There are two strategies related to that. And then also the work that we've been doing on our well ordinance update locally, which is going to be in our updated strategies will be um, listed there. So uh, the presentation today, I'm going to talk about first, why do we care about what are aquifers? And in order to do that, I think I need to define what an aquifer is to make sure we're all on the same page. So pardon me while I read the screen for just a moment. Um, an aquifer is a body of porous rocks or sediments saturated with groundwater. Groundwater enters the aquifers as precipitation as rain um, and seeps through the soil and it can move through the aquifers and resurface either through streams, through um, artisanal wells, springs, and uh, through wells when we extract it ourselves. Um, for visual learners, next slide. Um, here's an image of what that looks like. So what we're talking about when we're talking about our local aquifers, we're talking about the places in our geology where groundwater is found and our role in managing and protecting that um, so that that source of groundwater is there for future uses. All right, next slide. So to begin, I'm gonna give a little bit of a primer on water supplies throughout the county. Um, this is a great graphic that um, shows Countywide, it, it shows not only our watersheds, but also where the communities within those watersheds get their water, whether it's surface water or groundwater. Now, it's important to understand that Santa Cruz is not connected to any state water projects. We're not even hydrologically connected really to anybody outside of the county except through the Pajaro River, um, which means that all of our water that we rely on comes to us from rain that fell within the county. So, you know, we hear about things like the Bay Delta, we hear about the tunnels, we hear about the state water project, we hear about the Sierra snowpack. None of that actually impacts our local water supplies here. And that's really critical because it means no one's out there to help us. We have to be completely independent and, and responsible with our water supplies. Um, Currently, there's a limited amount of recycled water. It's concentrated mainly in the Pajaro, as uh, Commissioner Colbertson was mentioning earlier. However, there is a new recycled water project that I will talk about a little bit later that will be coming online soon that will be actually used for potable uses. Um, other than that, all of the local water is surface water, which is water pulled from streams, uh, which we see on the North Coast and mostly throughout the San Lorenzo River. It's the main supply for the city of Santa Cruz and their customers. And then Scotts Valley and from sort of mid-county south is almost entirely uh, reliant on groundwater. All right, next slide. So in order to manage something, you need to be able to track it. And so that is something the county has been doing since the early 80s. Every year we reach out to all of the water suppliers in the county, um, which the county is not one other than the community of Davenport, but we do work closely with the, the water agencies. We oversee the small water systems and we get numbers from them about their number of connections, which is basically the number of households, um, the population served if they have it, how much water they use and what the source of that water was. And we've been collecting this for a very long time. Uh, we track it and it gives us some really useful insights into the value of our various water supplies. So one click, please. In terms of water use, we're around 50-50 in terms of domestic, commercial, and agricultural water use. And the, the bulk of the agricultural water use is concentrated in South County around the Pajaro Valley. Uh, next. And water source. Now you can see why it is so critical that we protect our local aquifers because groundwater is 76% of the water used by people within the county. Next slide. 
This is a slide showing, again, the data that we've been collecting since the 80s, uh, looking at residential water use. This is a little tangential, but I think it is really important information to understand that while our population has been increasing since the 1980s, our per capita water use and our total water use for residential and commercial uses has been declining since around the year 2000, such to the point that 2023, was our lowest water use since we've been tracking it. So despite the fact that our population has increased, our water use has gone down and last year was the least amount of water that we have used as a community since the 1980s. Next slide. This slide is, to, is a map showing our salmonid bearing streams. We have um, endangered coho and threatened steelhead within our county, and we have an obligation to protect them. When we overpump our groundwater aquifers, we are pulling that water at a cost, and that cost is in some cases stream flow um, because groundwater provides a significant amount of the base flow that streams use. So if, it, if it's October and it hasn't rained in six months and you see a flowing stream, you know that that stream is coming, that water is coming from somewhere and it's most likely groundwater. So as we overpump our our aquifers, we risk damaging our precious surface water resources and the species that use them. Next. Um, while I'm not going to talk too much about groundwater quality in this presentation, I do want to just throw it out there to mention that a lot of the work that we do in environmental health is actually focused on groundwater quality. Um, you know, all the work that we've done with septic systems and regulations regarding our um, septic system programs. Uh, we over we manage gas stations, uh, hazardous waste sites. Um, and, and monitor ex um, extensively to make sure that our groundwater quality is acceptable. So this is something that we're working on. It's not something I'm gonna talk more about, but I did think it was worth mentioning. All right, next. So uh, credit to the city of Santa Cruz Water Department. They have done just immense work when it comes to climate modeling, uh, more so than anyone else in the county that I'm aware of. Um, and they have, been using models because of their reliance on surface water and the risks of um, extended droughts for their ability to serve their community. As they've been planning their water supply projects, they've been really focused on trying to identify how much water is going to be coming to them in the future and how that water is going to come. Um, and they put together this slide. So this is a basically a comparison of all of the different models that they've been looking at and kind of what are they predicting in terms of uh, precipitation and temperature because those two things together are critical to water supply. Um, and every model is wrong. All of these models are wrong, but they're all telling us somewhat of a similar story. Um, next slide. So there are some things that we are expecting to see when it comes to climate change. Um, droughts are going to become more frequent and more severe. Rain will come in less frequent but larger events. Total rainfall may be about the same, but it's going to come in these atmospheric river events rather than sort of a slow, wet, like extended rainy period. Um, big events tend to lead to erosion and runoff and a lot less groundwater recharge because the water is moving too quickly, the soils get saturated and it just all ends up in the ocean um, where we can't use it. Uh, increased evapotranspiration is another concern. That's um, a concern both for the agricultural community because it means they need to apply more water. It's also a concern along streams because it means that the riparian vegetation will be using more of that surface water to keep itself um, healthy. Uh, potential extensions in the growing period and um, studies indicate there will be an overall reduction in fog, which will lead to warmer days. Next slide. So that was sort of the background on why it is that we need to protect and manage our local aquifers. So now I'm going to move to how are we doing that? The first is through sustainable groundwater management. So in 2015, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act went into effect, which required the creation of groundwater sustainability agencies to manage their basins, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, and development of groundwater sustainability plans to put us on a pathway to reach sustainability by um, 
2040 and 2042 and maintain that sustainability for 50 years thereafter. So there are three groundwater sustainability agencies in the county. Uh, the county itself is a member of the Santa Margarita and the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agencies. We're um, signatories to the Joint Powers Authority that created those agencies. Uh, we have two county supervisors sitting on each of their boards. Uh, I am on the executive staff of both of those agencies and we contribute financially to the work of those agencies. The third groundwater sustainability agency, PV Water, um, predates Sigma, but was specifically called out in the act. The county's not a part of PV Water, but we are constantly working with them. Um, I was on their update committee as they were updating their um, basin management plan to meet the Sigma requirements. And we work very closely because they share a boundary with the Mid-County Agency. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration that is happening there. Next slide. So geographically, this is where those agencies fall. And if you remember that first slide I showed you with the map of where people use surface water and groundwater, these groundwater sustainability agencies are located where people are using the most groundwater, which is why they were created in the first place. Um, so the Santa Cruz, Mid-County, and Pajaro Valley um, Basins. So these are at the outlines of what we're seeing is the basin. So the basin is basically the collection of aquifers that are used to provide um, water supply. So um, both Santa Cruz, Mid County, and Pajaro were considered critically overdrafted um, due to the seawater intrusion happening in those locations and are therefore on an accelerated timeline. Um, but if you can go to the next slide. Um, all of the agencies have now submitted their plans. So I mentioned they needed a groundwater sustainability plan. These plans are there to help us focus on mitigating the impacts of overpumping on these specific indicators, which were a reduction in groundwater storage, seawater intrusion, degraded water quality, land subsidence, which thankfully we do not experience in this county and therefore did not have to address, chronic groundwater um, overdraft or chronic lowering of groundwater lever levels and surface water depletion. So all of those basins have plans um, that focus on these issues. And there was an extensive process that I will not get into now, but those plans are available. Um, next slide. So where we are right now in the process of groundwater sustainability planning, um, we've created our groundwater agencies, we wrote our plans, they were reviewed and approved by the state. And so now we are implementing these plans. Next slide. So what does implementation look like? Uh, it includes monitoring. We have a much more extensive groundwater and, um, and also surface water monitoring program. Thanks to these GSAs, a lot more uh, wells have gone in to monitor. Um, we have to do a lot of reporting. We have to do outreach. Um, we have to do modeling um, to make sure we can reach sustainability. And we have to do projects. Now, these G GSAs, because they are joint powers of existing agencies, are not actually implementing projects themselves, but they are helping to coordinate the implementation of projects and make sure that the projects that are being planned um, by the water agencies mainly will meet those sustainability goals. So the first project um, is the Pure Water Soquel Recycled Water Project, which is, um, this slide came from them, but I should say this slide is a few months old, so, and things are moving quickly. Um, but just high level of what that project is, that project is a advanced treatment uh, recycled water project. So instead of using recycled water for irrigation as we have in the past in this county, this will actually be um, purifying it to potable standards. So the water, the source water is coming from the city of Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant at Neary Lagoon. Um, if everybody can think back to the last year of horrendous traffic in and around that blue line, now you know what that was for. There was, um, they had to install a pipeline that entire distance. Um, to the Chanticleer site. So right where the overpass um, pedestrian bridge over Highway 1 just went in with the pretty whales on it, right there is located the purification plant um, where the water will be treated. And then um, 
the way this project is designed, the treated water then gets injected into the aquifer. So rather than serving it directly, it's getting injected um, into the aquifer through these three locations on the map. Um, yeah, so that should produce around at this point, oh well, this is all in million gallons, but it's about 1500 acre feet a year. All right, next slide. So now I'm going to move to South County for a little, for a second here. Um, PV Water is implementing a number of projects that um, are really substantial and critical to maintaining agriculture in that area. Um, the College Lake project is one of them. Again, if you've experienced traffic in and around Watsonville, that is probably why. Um, it's, it's, it's being constructed right now and is... Um, taking water from the col from College Lake that had historically been drained by a reclamation district. Um, so there was water there, the water was pumped out, and then that look the lake was used for agriculture. So then more water was pumped from the ground to irrigate that agriculture. Now the water that instead of being drained out um, by a reclamation district is going to be captured and treated by PV water and put into their uh, distribution line. Um, this is a pretty substantial project. It could yield up to 3,000 acre feet a year. Um, next slide. Also down in Pajaro, the Watsonville Slough project is um, not as far along in construction, but um, is, is moving forward. That project takes water from Watsonville Slough and puts it through um, a recharge basin. So they already have one project like this, but it's, it's basically taking that water, recharging it, and then using it for um, distribution. So those two projects together are, are that's another 2,000 acre feet, very significant for that area. Um, next slide. And lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the city of Santa Cruz is doing. Um, again, this is mid-county that we're focusing on, but also a little bit in the Santa Margarita. They're, they're looking into potentially doing this. Um, it, they're doing a project called Aqua for Storage and Recovery. What that means is they are taking surface water when it's available um, through their North Coast or North Coast sources or the San Lorenzo River, um, treating it to drinking water standards at their treatment plant, injecting it into a series of wells in the Live Oak area, and letting it sit there during the winter. And then during the summer or during drought periods when they need more water and the surface water is not available, they are able to recover that water and pump it back out through those wells. So they are already kind of in the process of doing these, implementing these projects. It should provide about um, just under a thousand acre feet a year um, so far, but there's a lot of potential for expansion of this after these um, initial kind of pilot projects are implemented. Um, next slide. So in these groundwater sustainability plans, uh, just through those projects that I described, we're talking about the creation of about 8,600 acre feet a year of water. Um, to visualize that one acre foot is about enough for four households for a year. Loch Lomond Reservoir, our only surface water in uh, reservoir within the county is about 8,600 acre feet as well. So it's basically doubling our storage capacity through these projects and these should all be implemented within the next few years. So when it comes to groundwater management, these are sort of the big hitters in what um, is being done by the groundwater agencies. And now I'll talk a little bit more about what's being done specifically by the county. Thank you. Um, we are updating our well ordinance. Uh, what is a well ordinance? Um, it is the what we use when we when people are applying to put a well in the ground to extract groundwater to use for either domestic or agricultural or commercial um, uses. We oversee an environmental health. We review their application to make sure that their um, proposed well is not going to create any. Um, issues when it comes to the where it's extracting the water from or creating a conduit for water quality impairments in the groundwater. Um, and it's also implementing policies in the general plan and the local coastal plan. Um, next slide. So 
Our well, this is the history. I'm not going to read all of this, but this is just the history of the updates of our well ordinance. So as you can see, it has been, it had been updated on a fairly regular basis up until 2009, and it has not been updated since. Um, and this is a, this is a really important ordinance. It does you know, kind of, it gives us the authority to to manage how wells are being used and put into the ground to some extent. Um, so 2009, that's, that's 15 years. That's a really long time for something of such importance. Next slide. So the reason why we're doing this update now, um, well, there are many reasons. One, as you recall, groundwater sustainability agencies didn't even get formed until 2015. So there's no reference to them or their uh, their mandates to manage groundwater in our current well ordinance, and that leads to problems with communication and, and oversight. And um, we need to resolve that. Uh, there are some some other requirements that have come down from the state regarding drought response and making sure that we're not putting in wells in areas where they're going to go dry. Um, and making sure that we're not allowing someone to put in a well in a location where they will dewater their neighbor's well or dewater a nearby creek. Um, there is a lot of ongoing case law happening right now um, from the environmental standpoint about when ministerial versus discretionary permits can be issued when it comes to wells. Um, and right now we, we operate only with ministerial wells permits. Um, we have had a written con letter concerning um, the possible impact on fisheries of our ministerial well ordinances from the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, and we have, again, our climate action and adaptation plan. There's no reference to that. Um, our drought response and outreach plan, which was adopted in 2022, there's no reference to that. Um, and there is a complete lack of regulatory oversight of soil borings in what we currently do. So really, it was time for an update. Next slide. Um, as if you didn't know it was important, this should help you understand why it's important. There are over 9,000 wells in the county and they are everywhere. Um, most of the water use is in the um, in those kind of groundwater basins, but there are still people who have wells that are pulling from small aquifers or even fractures um, in, fr in hard rock throughout the county. And in a lot of the more remote parts of the county, there is no other source of water. There's no surface water. There's no water agency. You have to have a well if you're going to have a, a house. And we require you to have a water source if you're going to have a house. So um, for that reason, it really is important that, that this is something that we are on top of and that we are able to be flexible with over time. Next slide. So to develop the update to the well ordinance, we pulled together a technical advisory committee of um, experts um, with varying uh, interests in groundwater management. So we had representatives from agriculture. Uh, we had representatives from well drillers who are really the most expert when it comes to well construction um, of anyone else in the county. We had a couple members of our water advisory commission, the groundwater sustainability agencies, um, biotic resource representatives from CDFW and NOAA Fisheries, but also I should say, um, we have been working closely with the Nature Conservancy, Cal Trout, um, Trout Unlimited, yeah, on on the what we've come up with when it comes to our biotic resource protection. And then we had public utility representatives and someone from the De California Department of Water Resources. Next slide. So there are a lot of changes in the ordinance and some of them are significant. The first one I'm gonna mention is that there is now a tiered approach to well permits. So small lower tiers have less, um, basically fewer hoops to jump through. And those are going to be your domestic well or a replacement for an existing well where it's being replaced like for like. Um, higher, higher tiered wells, bigger capacity, new water uses, water uses in areas of concern are going to have to do a higher level of review. And at tier four, they become discretionary, which means they will need a permit and they will need to do, or they will need to do uh, CEQA and they could be denied if we do not feel that they can be done in a way that is responsible. 
Um, we are also requiring more water quality. Oh, that says treatment. It should be testing. So more water quality testing as well as they're going in because we are learning more and more about the water quality impairments we have throughout the county, some naturally occurring, some uh, as a result of land use. Um, but there are people out there who are drinking water that may not be safe and they don't know it because it's never been tested. So now we are requiring more extensive testing and we are going to be requiring a time of sale test for water quality so that a new buyer will know what they're getting into in terms of their water quality. Um, we're also proposing yield testing for time of sale because we've had a lot of issues where um, wells are not producing what the seller claims they are producing and a buyer may not actually have sufficient water for their own health and safety, and that's not acceptable. Um, yeah, so we're also gonna be requiring metering on large capacity wells. So anything over two acre feet or for non-domestic purposes, we'll have to have meters and reporting. That sounds dramatic, but I should say that the groundwater sustainability agencies, all three of them are already requiring that. Pajaro has had a program for decades doing just that. So it's actually a very small number of wells that would be impacted by that because of the county's ordinance. Um, and I can't get into all of the details here um, tonight about all of the changes that we will be making, but we will be doing a workshop next week at the Water Advisory Commission on this topic starting at 4.30 um, on, in the Redwood Room, which is just sort of around the corner from here and also online where we will be presenting on sort of all of the updates and all of the analysis that we have done, which has been really extensive. Um, and I also think that was my last slide. <laughs> Thank you, Sierra. I appreciate that. Uh, do we have um, an open up for any questions from the commissioners at all? Anyone? Great work. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I just have one or two comments. The uh, original description of an aquifer uh, at the bottom, it said it comes up as either a spring or into a river. But one of the things that's important is that it actually, some of the aquifers, particularly I'm, I'm working with a pajaro one, it drains into the ocean. Yes. So, uh, and whenever you're saying we're worried about saltwater intrusion, the reason you're worried about saltwater intrusion is that connectivity between the freshwater and the saltwater. And the reason we don't have subsidence is because if the freshwater drains out, the saltwater drains in so the land doesn't subside. And saltwater intrusion is a, is a problem. And that means that when you char recharge aquifers, it may not just be sitting there waiting to be drawn back out like a bank. It may be draining somewhere else. It's like saying we're going to recharge a river and then be able to get water out of the river later, it may not always work that way. That's what the, we do extensive modeling on the yeah. projects if we're relying on them for water supply, yes. The other uh, comment about Santa Cruz County relying totally on Santa Cruz rainfall, and except with exception of the Pajaro, that's because the Pajaro watershed uh, only has 10% of the watershed in our county between Santa Cruz and Monterey and Therefore, 90% or 80% of the watershed is from San Benito, Santa Clara County. So we do have a lot of water that we have to work with other counties to worry about. And of course, there's a huge flood project working on that. But anyway, a lot of good information. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so um, uh, thanks for being so patient. Everyone, I, I'd like to open up. We'll go ahead and uh, I guess we'll do three minutes intervals for um any public comment that we have on any of the presentations tonight because i think that's going to wrap it up for us for presentations so um again thank you for being patient if anybody any had any uh public comments we're going to open that now thank you hi good evening i'm woody rehanek i was with a uh, campaign for organic and regenerative ag in november when you came to watsonville at that time, I mentioned SB 1383 in the compost program in Santa Clara County. They found they had more compost than they knew what to do with. So they decided not only to incentivize the use of compost by farmers by awarding up to $30,000 grants per farm, but also other uh, climate smart strategies like mulching uh, and uh, uh, cover cropping, hedgerow planting, riparian rebuild, and so on. All of these things are climate smart in that once you have the microbial 
healthy soil, uh, which is you can transition to with an application of compost, you're starting to sequester carbon. And so what I, it's called the Agricultural In Resilience Incentive Program, Santa Clara County, they have a website. Julie Morris is a contact person. Uh, we're working with Felipe Hernandez to try to get that program funded here. And uh, the, at the end of 2022, at the Omnibus Bill, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous, uh, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren uh, earmarked $750,000 for this program. It's administered by the Department of Planning and Development in Santa Clara County. We're looking for a place to land it here. Felipe is talking not only with Zoe, but with Jimmy Panetta. We'd really like to get the ARI program, the Agricultural Resilience Incentive Program, which has already been modeled four or five years there, here in Santa Cruz County. San Mateo County is also interested. So thank you for your time. Thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. And anybody else from the public? Yeah. I'm sorry that I'm only able to have three minutes for all of the different uh, presentations. But so I will focus on what's most important to me. I'm Beverly Day Show. I'm with the Electric Vehicle Association. We introduced electric vehicles to the area about 19, 20 years ago. Um, so the, I have too many things to say. Uh, the um, five county CCA says that our emissions are coming 70 plus percent from vehicles, not just the 50 something percent that it says on your site um, that the county is assuming 51%, I think it is your county is assuming that your emissions for, from vehicles are. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has a, um, a refuse truck that's all electric. And they had another one scheduled for this summer, but I don't know if they've gotten that one yet. I haven't checked in. Um, so I'm not sure how, um, how far it is from Marina to what, the Buena Vista in order to carry waste there? I'm not, I was a little confused by uh, what is um, the problem with having an electric vehicle that would go from one place to the other, but maybe you could answer that afterwards. I wanna just um, say a couple more things. Um, I, I, I thought I was, I thought what I was, going to hear today would be a presentation of your, like a executive summary of your whole climate action plan. Um, so uh, I don't know, I came in a bit late and I apologize. I don't know if you presented anything with regard to uh, other than the active uh, transportation issues such as biking and walking and all of that. Um, the metro buses are using CNG, which is basically methane. So we have this whole program to try to eliminate methane and our buses are using methane. And the ones that are, have been ordered, the 57 buses that have been ordered for the transit system are from hydrogen, which is coming 95 to 98% from fossil fuels. There is no green to, that has scaled up. And all of those green, yellow, blue, they're all, I think, designed to confuse the public. But essentially right now, what we have is actually much worse even. And also the figures that I have about uh, the emissions from, uh, from methane is that it's 100 and 20 times the heating capacity of uh, CO2 in the first 10 years, the next 10 years, then it goes down to maybe 80%. So it's a short-lived, but it's much, uh, much worse in terms of 
the impact that it's having on the environment now, leading us to critical tipping points. Um, also, oh, I wanted to invite you, there's, uh, I just found out today, there's a trucks, truck stop thing happening from CARB, California Air Resources Board in Seaside on August, oh, I think it's the 13th, I'm not, oh, the 20th, I'm sorry, it's in Seaside, and they will have examples there of the large vehicles that you can all have a look at. Um, I can email the details to whoever is interested in that. Um, I, I don't, well, you guys aren't the Metro board, but it's, it was a big mistake to order 57. <laughs> Hydrogen buses, we should be going electric. I understand some of the concerns, but um, it doesn't apply to most routes. So anyway, um, and CARB also with regard to the larger vehicles, CARB has um, mandates for when they need to be transitioned out of uh, gas and, and uh, diesel to electric. Well, they're saying to zero emissions and that's unfortunate, but it should be too electric. So um, I have a lot more things to say, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Beverly. Appreciate it. And all the work that you do too. Chris, John. Yeah, John. Um, Chris, if the public has more to say and would like to send us emails or other correspondence, where should that go? Yeah. Um, so David, can we direct that to you? Or I'm, I'm happy to take it myself, but in that can, that can go through me. Okay. Okay, um, so we can make that available, I yeah, guess, at the end of the meeting. My contact information is on the Commission on the Environment website. Okay, okay, great, great. And then, uh, sir? Yeah, is this being recorded? It is, yeah. If you could say your name too, that would be helpful. Absolutely. My name is James Ewing Whitman. It's nice to be addressing all of you. I've got better attendance during public comments in more than any of the supervisors the past four years. So that was interesting. I'm glad that it's being recorded. There's um, a great deal of information that could be certainly interpreted differently. There are individuals that have added up the carbon footprint of 100 and, of 106 of the 196 of the 206 industrialized countries on planet Earth, and that's the carbon footprint. Natural volcanology produces 15 times that amount of carbon dioxide. So these reductions. Only carbon that this county seems to be proliferating is the reduction of the human population. Um, as far as quoting, you know, all these models are wrong. The last person who was speaking, of course, was just talking about the groundwater. You know, the electric buses, that's going to be interesting. They're quite widely used in... Um, Europe, let's say a fire truck or a garbage truck. Last winter, a garbage truck couldn't, an electric garbage truck couldn't even last four hours during the winter. When you compare that to the duty cycle of a diesel, it's one 250th. Now, diesel electric is absolutely the way to go. And when you look at our modern diesel electrics, which still use the OPOC engine that was originally designed in 1896. But it has quite a few refinements now. So when people are talking about green, I just could, just off the notes I took, I could talk for a couple hours on that. So I am glad that this is being recorded. I don't want to be competitive or anything. I think we're all in this together. And I'm glad that I read about this at 420 and decided I could make it down here. So that's enough for now. Thank you. And I'm glad there's a meeting next week. Appreciate it. Thank you. And anybody on Zoom for any public comment? Anybody else in the uh, audience? I think we have one more in the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. I'm Kaylee Bessie. I'm an undergrad at CSUMB. I'm not currently with an organization, but I predict that I will be soon. I do want to say thank you for the Climate ad Adaptation and Action Plan. I'm looking for more actions I can take to support that and be an active hand in that plan. I am particularly interested in the waste management since I've been working in restaurants since I was 16 years old. And I was wondering if the SP 1382 is also going to be implemented for the restaurants as well and corporations because um, it's just been something that I've experienced since I've worked there. And I'm just wondering when that's going to hit the industry that I work in as 
well. Um, thank you again for all of your time and your hard work. Great, thank you. Anybody want to answer that uh, in terms of 1383? Um, so 1383 uh, implemented for restaurants in uh, January of this year. But the thing is, we don't have a lot of restaurants in Santa Cruz County that are actually of that are regulated by SB 1383 because most of our restaurants are too small. Um, and I think the so there's a certain amount of waste that they have to generate in order to fall under 13. It's actually not about waste. The way that restaurants are categorized, it's the number of seats they have or the square footage. So it's either 250 plus seats in the restaurant or uh, I think it's 5,000 square feet. Okay. Okay. And we can't say that grocery stores are involved in that as well too. So there's a tremendous amount of well, grocery stores were implemented in uh, January 1st of 2022 and all of our grocery stores qualify. Although there are a fair number of smaller markets that don't qualify. And again, it's based on for grocery stores, it's square footage and sales and the products that they carry. So the regulations are pretty specific. Okay, great, thank you. And any other comments from the public? Hello everyone, I'm Nancy Falstick. I'm the Director of Regeneration, Pajo Valley Climate Action. Um, really great to hear these updates. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more if anybody can speak to B-Cycle. In Watsonville, I was part of um, you know, some of the planning that was going on over the last couple of years about bringing it to the county. And I know that it is on board for the entire county. It was just a little heartbreaking in those conversations to hear you know, what it would look like rolling out in Watsonville, where it was going to start first at UCSC in Santa Cruz with hundreds of bikes and hundreds of dock stations and Watsonville was slated to get, I think maybe it was 25 bikes and 50 stations um, because it is a for-profit company and they're concerned about trying it out in a different kind of population. I know it has since changed with money that's coming in through um, Ecology Action um, to support the B-Cycle program and increase the number of bikes in Watsonville, but I think it's still going to be a pretty small number. And every time I thought about it, I just thought it's going to be doomed to failure from the beginning, because if there aren't bikes in enough locations, you have to return it to a dock. It's not going to help people get around very well. And I don't know, it's, again, it's just an equity issue and you know how do we make it affordable how do we make it accessible so that there's enough of them that you can go enough places to actually use them effectively so if anybody has ideas on that now that would be that'd be great to hear thank you nancy and for all your work too down in wattsville thank you so much yeah. John. i'd just like to say that the commission on the environment uh used to have a mandate that was very broad and the board of supervisors did a review of county commissions and that we're gonna speak in a few minutes about the revised uh, mandate for the Commission on the Environment, but it basically boils down to supporting the climate action and adaptation plan and making sure that we keep an eye on climate justice and equity. So um, your comments are very well received here. Thanks. Okay, and um, any other comments from the public in, uh, through the Zoom call or no? No, okay. nobody online with a question. Thank you, yep, and one more, sir. Hi, my name is Dustin Lopez. I just had a, some questions on the water. Um, it might have been covered, but I'm not sure. I was wondering, can only potable water be pumped into the aquifers or can standard recycled water be pumped there? Um, not just in terms of like what is legally required right now, but like uh, logistically or just um, in the future possibly. And also, could recycled water be pumped directly into streams or rivers instead of uh, pumping it into the ocean, any excess? Thank you. Oh, also, what day is the Water Commission meeting next week? Thank um, you. I, I can respond if you'd like. Yes, yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, it, 
The first question regarding whether it has to be potable to be injected into the aquifer, yes, it, it does um, because it's going directly into a, a water supply source um, and you need at least two months travel time from where it gets injected to where it gets extracted. Um, so it, it's a highly regulated water source. Um, direct potable reuse has actually only been approved this year in California for use, and nobody's proposing a project for that here, but that um, the water needs to be treated to an even higher standard, which is very difficult to achieve. Um, you can uh, in, you can directly put water into surface water sources. It doesn't even necessarily need to be um, treated to tertiary standards. That's actually the standard way that wastewater um, treated wastewater gets, if you don't have an ocean outline outfall, you're usually um, sending treated wastewater into a surface water or river. So um, it doesn't need to be treated to um, potable standards, but it, again, you would need, it's heavily regulated anything doing to do with that. Um, and the Water Commission meets on Wednesday. So sorry if that wasn't on the slide. It's uh, next week, Wednesday, August 7th. Um, the meeting starts at four and the water the workshop on the well ordinance will be at 4 30. it'll be available online to um participate great thank you sierra appreciate that um do we have any more public comments no if we don't um we're going to go ahead and move on to the next agenda item which is going to be the um consider the proposed amendments to the santa cruz county code section 2.54 and bylaws for the Commission on the Environment. So we have thank two documents. You. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you guys so um, much. Staff, I was trying to get so everything done time. Yeah, we really appreciate all your time and and, uh, and the presentations. Thank you. Thanks for sticking out for the whole time. <laughs> appreciate it. <sighs> no, no, no. Appreciate that, Jenny. Thank you. Um, so, uh, David, I think you you had a few comments about the, um, the new bylaws. Uh, yes. And... I sent those around to the commissioners um, and that was the, uh, did, did you all receive the, the bylaws and the ordinance update? And so the updates to the, the bylaws haven't been updated in a long time. And there's been recent updates to um, the ordinance county code 2.38 that regulates commissions in general. Um, and so all the commissions are going through and updating their bylaws to make it consistent to make them consistent with those updates to uh, the county code on commissions in general. Um, and so that's pretty straightforward. There's no real significant changes to the bylaws, just, just some little, little changes here and there. Um, for example, um, now the county code chapter 238 provides for not only a chairperson and a vice chairperson, but you can choose to have co-chairs if you'd like. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the difference is, but, but you can do that. For, for example, it's th these are minor changes like that. Um, and then the changes to 2.54, which is the county code chapter 2.54, which is the co county, county code that establishes the commission on the environment is being amended to, as commissioner Hunt pointed out, change the, uh, purpose of the commission to um, uh, from this broad description of of advising the board of supervisors regarding environmental issues to focusing more on the climate action and adaptation plan, which you know arguably does include a very broad range of environmental issues as, as we've heard tonight and we'll and we'll hear, hear more of in future meetings but and so um and in fact your commission has already seen those changes in, that i presented in previous meetings so um what i'm planning on doing is bringing both of those by uh, those those changes have to be approved by the board of supervisors so i'll be bringing those to the board of supervisors i think on on their august 27th agenda um and so i'm just looking for the, this commission to approve both of those um uh documents the changes to both of those documents at this meeting and then i'll i'll report that to the board that the commission has taken action to approve the updated bylaws and the updated ordinance 
Okay. Um, so any of the commissioners too, if you guys had any questions about that, hopefully everybody's had a relative chance. Um, hopefully you got a few yet, yeah. Jenny. Yeah, I know questions. Thank you, David, for doing the work. I think we've gone over these a few times. Um, I think this reinvention of our, mi our mission or focus is what I would call it is really important. It's going to really be helpful. Obviously, um, there was a great deal of interest in what we were, uh, what staff was presenting tonight. And we had a good audience for it and we're going to continue those objectives. And I think that this is just another opportunity for the county to talk about the good works we're doing. And, and so I have no question. That's my comment. I'm a, I, I move the uh, recommended action. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Can we go ahead and take a vote then? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Okay. And Moving on real quick, you guys. Um, so discussion of upcoming uh, items of interest on the Board of Supervisors calendar for August 27th. Um, I think David, you already kind of went over that. And Jenny, unless you had anything that, yeah. I don't think anybody, um, unless David, you had anything to add to that. No, I looked at the um, master, that's called the master calendar. And that's that's the one item that popped out at me that had okay. any relevance to this commission. Um, okay. And I, yeah. I just talked about that. There, there's going to be a separate report um, from the county administrative office on some other restructuring of of other commissions. Okay. Um, and this, our 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 um, amendments were going to be part of that report, but it, I guess it turns out that, that that report's going to be a little bit unwieldy. I guess. And so I'm going to just take our amendments as a separate item to the board. Okay. So that's what you'll see on the August 27th agenda. Okay. All right. And that'll probably be approved then, I'm sure, huh? most likely, depending, I guess. I think so. assume it will be approved yeah. with okay. no. <laughs> All right. No. So, um, okay. And then you guys, I'll go over the uh, the 3C pod and uh, podcast update. We'll make that pretty pretty clear or pretty quick. Um, so 3C, the last uh, Community Advisory Council meeting, uh, released a blueprint report, which presents, it's a strategic vision to uh, basically accelerate deployment of medium, medium and heavy duty EVs. And I was thinking about you when <laughs> when, uh, when you were presenting um, and charging infrastructure in California's Central Coast region that aligns with 3C's goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and supporting the transition to clean and renewable energy. Um, and this was the result of a 3CE applying for, uh, for applying for and being awarded a California Energy Commission's Clean Transportation Program grant in March of 2023. So they have a pretty extensive blueprint report that's out there. Um, they saw AMBAG basically saw a gap between, um, you know, medium and heavy duty vehicles, EV vehicles, particularly that wasn't really being addressed. And they saw 3CE as a potential for that. And then when the grant came through, so that's going to be kind of interesting to see how that develops. Um, and then they also reported out on uh, the uh, energy program status. So Central Coast Community Energy, as, as you most, as most people, know have these energy programs that rebates and, and different financial incentives that are out there. Uh, so fiscal year to date, the Electrify Your Ride program has distributed over $2 million in rebates, and that's up from $1.7 million that had been distributed this time last year. The new construction uh, electrification program has distributed over $500,000 for new all electric housing developments, including 174 affordable housing units. And the Plan Your Fleet program has already been fully subscribed for uh, fiscal year 2023 and 2024, proper, prompting an expansion of the program's scope and budget. Um, the fiscal year to date, Agricultural Electrification Program has distributed incentives for 14 projects in four, four counties. So the reason why I bring that up is, is that the money is going out there. You know, they are addressing a lot of the programs that this is the in, initial intent of 3CE was to keep that money local. And we're seeing that really flow out now and that those budgets are starting to go up too. Um, so it's something that I kind of want to emphasize for 3CE that a lot of the things that they were hoping to do, you know, is coming to fruition now with, with those numbers. Um, they also, 3CE just recently launched a battery rebate program that seeks to better match customer energy demand with the available renewable energy supply through increased residential use of behind the meter battery storage. So, you know, battery storage is going to be a major issue. You're seeing incentives with that. The only thing I wasn't too super crazy about that it, you would have to transfer over to the um, net billing tariff. So if you guys are familiar with NEM1 and NEM2, you would have to give up that NEM2 status in order to move to be eligible for this battery rebate program. And um, 
it was something that I was kind of pushing back on a little bit to see if there was an appeals process that we potentially could go through for that. I thought that was something that might hurt the program a little bit more, but uh, that's a kind of a different philosophy that they have that those types of um, programs are, are taking away from low-income houses in order to finance that M1 and M2, which has a 25-year 25, 25 grandfather uh, you know, time frame put on it. Um, and then finally, one of our own commissioners, Commissioner Jenny Johnson was elected as chair to the Community Advisory Council for 3CE for the next two years. Mm -hmm. So we've got one of our own on that side too as well. So that's going to be huge. Get ready for the uh, for the um, acceleration to be felt. Um, so congratulations, to Jenny, on that. That's going to be fun. Um, podcast update. So we are still working with uh, we're still working with the personal information officers on where these podcasts are going to go. We have two right now. Um, and then we're doing one tomorrow with, um, with, uh, Tatiana Brennan and, uh, Beverly, to your point, that will be more of kind of a comprehensive conversation about the cap, the full cap. And, um, and I think an FAQ page was probably going to come out of the questions that were generated in that. So that will have kind of a, you know, a boiled down version is because the cap document is fairly big and, and comprehensive. This is going to be a conversation about that. And also hopefully some FAQs will come out as a result of that too. So boiled down a little bit more digestible is, is what the plan is anyway. Um, let's see. So, so to, uh, before we move to adjournment, I also would like to recognize another member of our commission and that's our own commissioner, Dr. John Hump for all of your work that was done uh, with the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation, that huge $71 million, I don't know if you guys have read about it in the paper, huge $71 million grant, which is one of the largest in state history for climate change. Uh, this grant will go toward a multitude of habitat restoration, food and fire risk reduction, and coastal resiliency projects, as well as a local workforce development in the Monterey Bay area. So thank you, John, for all the work. I, I probably don't even know how much work you put into that, but, uh, but thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I think an important part is there's a really large community outreach component to that. And so we really want to make sure that we get the cap involved with that and bring in, it's all focused on adaptation, it's not mitigation. So for the adaptation part of our outreach, we really wanna make sure we're meshed. And a, a really important part of that grant is establishing what's called the Monterey Bay Climate Action Adaptation Network. And the goal is to bring everybody around Monterey Bay in the watersheds of Monterey Bay together to work on climate adaptation, um, projects, planning, funding, all of that going forward. And it's going to be, um, there's some, the job descriptions are out for hiring now. We're hoping to get a really robust network coordinator. And uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll, that's a place where we're going to really want to tie into from the Commission on the Environment. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And with that, um, I think, yeah, you know, we have, yeah. 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 One more announcement on September 18th and 19th is the Central Coast Community Energy's annual meeting and Seascape Resort. It is a public meeting and you go to their website, you can see the time. It starts um, around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, something like that, one o'clock on the 18th and it goes for two days. Why this is important, if you're interested in meeting the board members, the staff members, the people who are implementing the programs, having implement and public input into their budget for the next year, their program budgets, anything that you want to learn about, meet people and just have fun and gloat, because you know what, that's what I intend to do. Um, please come, it'll be a lot of fun. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm here to gloat. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, and Brina, I yes. just have one uh -huh. more. Uh, I was a, a um, commissioner, I mean, excuse me, uh, with Supervisor Judson um, Cummings, as well as Supervisor uh, Manao Cohen, have a tobacco waste initiative that they would like to bring to the agenda and bring to the commission to sort of talk about. Um, I have Trina Barton who would like to sort of come and speak to us about that particular initiative. And so if we could put, possibly put it in the agenda for September. I'm yeah, yeah. And um, t t t and refresh me again, t uh, tobacco. This is a tobacco waste initiative. It's a, it's a policy that addresses tobacco waste, namely c cigarette butts in collaboration with several, several organizations and stakeholders. And so they're exploring ways to ban the retail sale of partially inconsumable tobacco okay. filters. Yeah, could you send whatever you have on that? If you could forward to me, that would be fantastic. Okay. And everybody knows that we're in Watsonville. 
um, next meeting to my understanding, right? Okay, awesome. John? I'll let it go. Okay, is that it? I'm trying to respect everybody's time. We're doing pretty well considering the information that we had. So uh, move to adjourn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Great, great. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate Recording it. Recording stopped.